Good evening. I'm Sally Shortall, a professor in the university, and I co-chaired the Public Lectures Committee. Welcome to tonight's lecture by Professor Steve Yearly from Edinburgh University, titled The First Human Genome at 20. How has genomics altered the way humanity understands itself? The lecture will be about half an hour, and I'll be back at the end of that with Steve for a live Q&A. If you want to ask a question, you can do so in the drop down uh, YouTube box on your screen, or you can tweet your question uh, to us at, at, at Public Insights NCL. If you're tweeting about the lecture, please hashtag Public Insights. So enjoy the lecture and uh, I will see you afterwards. And here to give Steve a more proper introduction is Professor Suzanne Moffat. Enjoy the lecture. Good afternoon. I'm Professor Suzanne Moffat of the Institute of Population and Health Sciences in the Medical Faculty at Newcastle University. And on behalf of Newcastle University, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to this public lecture. And it's also a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our speaker today, Professor Stephen Yearley from the University of Edinburgh. Professor Yearley is a sociologist by background and is Professor of the Sociology of Scientific Knowledge at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Yearley is based at Edinburgh University's School of Social and Political Science and leads the Science, Technology and Innovation Studies Unit. Professor Yearley is also the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, an institute that supports research and public engagement activities across the arts, humanities and social sciences through a range of interdisciplinary and international projects and programmes. Professor Yearley currently splits his time between the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities and, Sci and the Science and Technology Innovation Studies Unit. And as well as this, Professor Yearley is the Executive Secretary to the Scottish Consortium for Rural Research, which links the principal institutions concerned with environmental and agricultural research in Scotland. He's also co-founded the Centre for the Study of Science, Knowledge and Policy, which links science studies with political science and social policy at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Yearley is a world leading authority in social studies of science and in environmental sociology. His research interests include citizen science, justice and environment, environmental sociology, sociology of knowledge and science, sustainability and the sociology of climate change. Professor Yearley is particularly concerned with areas where these specialisms overlap and an example of this is his work in fostering public engagement in technical decision making um, through engaging, citizen, engaging citizens in urban air quality issues. Professor Yearley has numerous publications and is currently working on two books, one on the sociology of the climate changed world and the other is on the social sciences in the genomic age. Professor Yearley is going to address us with a public lecture entitled The First Draft Human Genome at 20. How has genomics altered the way humanity understands itself? I hope you enjoy the lecture. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this lecture. So 2020 is a poetic kind of name for a year, isn't it? it Maybe the only year in our lives when we can claim to have something like 2020 vision. And I think there's something about the sort of the play of the numbers, the 20 and the 20, that makes us think back maybe on achievements or reflect on histories or opportunities taken or opportunities maybe missed. So we're thinking about the draft of the human genome at 20. My name is Steve Yearley. I work at the University of Edinburgh and I'm delighted to be giving this Insights virtual lecture for Newcastle University today. And as I said, I'm going to be reflecting on 20 years of the Human Genome Project. So there are various anniversaries that you could mark, you know, the anniversary of the setting up, the anniversary of the more or less complete uh, first draft. But 2020 is a good time to look back on the year 2000 when the first draft was announced. 
So many of you possibly will remember in June 2020, uh, the dream team of uh, President Clinton and Prime Minister Blair announced the initial draft of the human genome. Uh, in, so here's the uh, copy of that that was uh, uh, the coverage in The Guardian. Uh, so Bill Clinton talking about the, uh, learning the language in which God created life uh, and uh, Tony Blair talking about uh, an endeavor taking us across the threshold. So we could talk about lots of things that have come since this um, first draft of the human genome, the way in which, for example, the price of uh, reading the genome and documenting the genome has come down, uh, or the way in which uh, lots of other species aside from us have had their genomes uh, mapped, uh, or the role in which uh, the role that genomics has played uh, recently in uh, thinking about the nature of um, the COVID uh, and its interaction with the human body and the development of vaccines. Uh, or even uh, now that we're thinking of having lots of people's genomes mapped, so we don't just have the standard genome that's an amalgamation of various people, but we're looking at the genomics of people from around the world. So, um, and there's something kind of extraordinary about our understanding of the genome in the sense that um, I think one of the things that has become very clear and that people have uh, really uh, taken on board in a big way is the, the kind of um, astonishing thing that the whole diversity of life is based on the same genome code. It's not that, uh, you know, life started several times with different uh, bases, that everything around us, you know, bacteria, uh, fungi, plants, us, all manner of animals, everything pretty much except viruses, uh, is based on, on DNA. So there's that uh, enormous sort of sense of wonder and insight that comes from the fact that, you know, sometime, uh, a billion or so years ago, uh, this molecule was taken up uh, and found a, a way of replicating itself uh, in life forms, and then that there have been, subsequent to that, a number of sort of breakthroughs uh, in the design of life. So, for example, a thing a bit like a bacterium, an archaeon, at some point uh, seems to have engulfed another bacterium, but without uh, gobbling it up, uh, and that seems to have been the origin of complex cells. So the thing that was swallowed became the nucleus, the thing that did the swallowing stayed as the cell. And then later on, we had an episode in which uh, uh, a, a bacterium which seemed to have uh, uh, got the hang of photosynthesis was again engulfed, and this became uh, the basis for the origin of plants, a sort of uh, uh, for multicellular organisms that could photosynthesize. So there's lots of things that we could think about uh, looking back on, celebrating for this 20th anniversary. But what I want to do today is something slightly different, which is that I want to think about what the anniversary has meant for human understanding of ourselves. So we've had 20 years of the human genome. What has that done for the way in which humans think about themselves, that's the understanding of our own conduct, our relation to the world around us? Now, I was... Uh, in a position to think about this because uh, of a position that I had uh, a few years ago. I used to run this uh, research center called the Genomics Forum, which uh, is uh, advertised on this slide. And um, essentially, uh, around the year 2000, when all of this excitement about the draft of the human genome uh, was current, uh, the, the government decided, the UK government decided to put uh, some additional research funding uh, into genomics. And I guess that the biologists and the medics thought that the majority of this would be for them, uh, quite rightly. Uh, but the enterprising guy who ran the Economic and Social Research Council at the time, a uh, sociologist called Gordon Marshall, made the case that, well, surely the human sciences should have some kind of say in this because the draft of the human genome speaks to the way in which we understand ourselves, our place within nature, and also maybe speaks to the way in which we understand and can account for human conduct. So 
uh, out of that uh, kind of intervention uh, came a decision to put some of the money from uh, this special investment in genomics into the social sciences, and they set up uh, four uh, research centers. So those are the ones on the slide now. Uh, and it, uh, I was fortunate enough to run the genomics forum, which was one of these centers which had a very cross-disciplinary focus because it's aim was to speak up for the role of social science in relation to policymakers uh, and to other medics and natural scientists who were working on the human genome. Now, it seems to me that there are lots of things you, you could uh, talk about, you know, uh, whether that's the preparation of novel forms of medicine or screening or uh, new ways of mapping kinship, those kinds of things. But in a way, one of the key challenges for the social sciences uh, in relation to the draft of the human genome was precisely um, how do we now think about how much of our conduct or our characteristics are explicable in genomic terms or how much is that down to the more customary things that we've always thought of, you know, our socialization, our upbringing, our background, uh, our will or volition. So how do these you know, we've got this exquisite insight into our genomic uh, makeup, but how exactly does that interact with all those other things that we know uh, and have documented to be important uh, in the understanding of uh, human conduct? So I think really this providing an opportunity, but also a big challenge for the social sciences to say, well, where is it that we uh, fit in now that we have this draft of the human genome and increasing uh, genomic knowledge? And it seems to me, um, obviously slightly uh, flippantly, um, that uh, the approach of uh, some people in the uh, social sciences and in the humanities more generally uh, have had a, a, you know, they've been worried about this challenge that comes from genomics, but they haven't quite known what to do about it. And sometimes it's reminded me of a film uh, from, well, and a book, uh, Sounds like a charades game here, but yeah, a film uh, from the 60s, uh, I believe, maybe just the turn of 70, um, that Woody Allen made that was based on a book called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex uh, But Didn't Dare Ask. Now, in the Woody Allen case, um, I guess, you know, the movie uh, is making the point that, well, there are lots of things you might want to know about sex, but you, you're afraid to ask because you don't want to show your naivety or you don't want to admit that you don't know. So to ask is going to be embarrassing because if you ask, well, you're deeply uncool. So the book is for people who want to be cool and are currently uncool. With the genome, I, th I don't think it's quite uh, uh, the same thing, but there's a concern, I think, about finding out what the answer is. So it's easy to say, well, genetics you know, or genomics, that can't explain much about people because people are so complicated, their environment is so important to them. Um, but unless you have a look at what genomic scientists think they are explaining, well, then you'll get into that situation. You know, you, you won't quite dare to ask and you won't find out what uh, they think. So, um, early on, during the mapping of the human genome, uh, obviously scientists were thinking about what it was they were likely to find out. And of course, the scientists working on this shared the common presumption that humans are very complicated. And so the assumption was that, well, to account for all that complication, there would have to be an awful lot of genes. That is, they expected to see the human genome as very rich in genes. Um, and this was uh, expressed in a rather nice way by a uh, then young uh, microbiologist, but now a, a very uh, well-established guy called Ewan Burney, um, who had the clever idea of setting up a bet uh, on this. So he said, you know, he set out some, some rules which are sort of entertainingly um, precise, but he set out some rules about uh, having a, a kind of a, a, a sweep, the gene sweep, uh, a sweepstake on how many genes there would finally be. And you can see in this plot here uh, that I mean, so the red line in the middle marks what the sort of the median guess was, uh, and then the blue lines are the distribution of how many people guessed numbers around that. But quite a lot of people thought there would be 100,000 genes or uh, maybe even 200,000 genes. Uh, but the answer came out that there were, give or take, uh, 21,000, you know, 20,000 and some. 
because we still haven't quite uh, agreed uh, exactly how the count should be done. So it seemed that, well, hang on, humans don't have that many genes, so where does our specialness come from? And in fact, you know, they only have, we, they, uh, we only have about as many as a mouse does. So when the, um, uh, so the scientists who are working in this area got together and there is now this genome reference consortium where they provide uh, the sort of authoritative statement of what the human genome draft is. Uh, down in the bottom of the slide, you can see also that they have uh, reference genomes available for uh, mice, uh, chickens, and zebrafish. Zebrafish will come up again in a second. Um, but by contrast with humans, many other life forms have much bigger genomes. So uh, plants, for example, have got the hang of doubling their chromosomes. They can do this in a way that we just can't. And they can have genomes that are maybe uh, tens of times bigger than ours. Uh, so with the, in some cases in the plants, with their chromosomes quadrupling or even going further. Now, there are other creatures who've got the hang of this also. So frog genomes are known for doubling and the salmon family and other fish as, as well. Now, we often hear this kind of claim, you know, that we're X percent similar to a banana or a pineapple or a, a tulip or whatever it is. Um, and so this, I, I guess, is, is taken as a kind of a, a point about humility. You know, well, we're not, uh, we don't have many more or hardly any uh, difference between us and a mouse. And we're very closely related to these other more um, humble forms of life, let's say. So uh, and it, one of the things that often comes out, because the zebrafish, which I mentioned before, are often used as a, a research animal. Zebrafish are stripy, as you'd imagine from their name, but they're also translucent so that you can see what's going on inside them in a way that's very handy for researchers. That's why they like uh, zebrafish. Um, but we're about 70% similar to zebrafish. But of course, we need to be careful um, exactly what we mean by this 70% idea. Now, you can see that at one level, the 70% idea is supposed to be an incentive to humility. You know, so don't get some idea that we're so fantastic compared to the rest of life because, you know, we're so similar to an onion or to a fish or uh, to a, um, a chimpanzee or something. And that those kind of figures, I think, are very com compelling. But of course, you need to look a bit more closely to think, well, what does that 70% mean? Um, I mean, clearly, they have genome capacity for things that we don't have. They need to know how to make gills. We don't need to bother with that. And a lot of the um, similarity actually comes from fundamental bits of the genome. Because if you think of our genomes and our genes, the genes have got to instruct for a lot of basic things, such as how to, well, I, I mean, they, they could be very complicated, uh, difficult to understand at a uh, microbic, uh, microscopic level, but they're basic in that nearly all cells do this. You know, how do you manage energy within cells? Or how do you go about constructing the body during growth? These are things that obviously we share in common uh, with fish and many other uh, life forms. Uh, but they don't seem very close to our individuality or the kind of things that make us human. Because, yeah, our cells handle energy basically in the same way as most other life forms. Um, but that doesn't tell us much about ourselves as humans. So where do we go with this? So um, you could say, well, we've got only... 20, 21,000 genes. But is our genome big? So uh, this uh, creature, it's a tuatara, it's a, a, a reptile. It's not, looks a bit like a lizard, but technically I think it isn't a lizard. Um, but its genome was sequenced uh, this year, tw in 2020, um, in a nice collaboration between uh, Maori uh, people for whom uh, the tuatara is important and uh, some biologists, uh, and it turns out that even the tuatara, uh, which branched off before 
dinosaurs and all those other lizards um, has got 50% bigger genome than us. So where do you go if you want to think about, you know, the size of our genome? Well, we know, uh, and I think this is, you know, widely known, widely uh, written about and so on, that uh, our genome ha is composed of about three billion letters. So the letters are made up of those A's and C's and G's and T's that we've all uh, learned about. Uh, and if you were to uh, decode or to, as it were, write down the whole of the genome, we have a string of these that's three billion cells, uh, three billion letters long in each of our cells that has a nucleus in it. Um, and so you get popular writers uh, celebrating this, uh, the scale of this in various ways. So Bill Bryson in his recent book on the body came up with a, a sort of a, a fact about this that I'd not seen before, uh, which is that if you imagine taking all of the DNA, so if you stretch all the DNA that's in the cell and you unfold it because it's three billion letters long, each of our cells has a twisted pair of lengths of DNA that are one meter long. So we have two meters of DNA uh, in each of our cells. And he said, if you took all our cells and you somehow tied all of those bits of DNA together, each of us would have a stretch of DNA that goes all the way out to Pluto, to the uh, orbit of Pluto. You could also say, and this one uh, is widely used in um, textbooks, about the complexity of the folding of the DNA. So you've got this super long molecule, but it's also incredibly narrow. It's at the sort of nano scale in its uh, breadth. Uh, and so it has to be very intensely folded to get it into the cell nucleus. And uh, so this uh, idea is that, well, if you imagined that the DNA molecule was a piece of uh, very, very, very super fine, sort of invisibly fine uh, thread, then uh, the, the trick of folding it into the nucleus of the cell is a bit like trying to get a 40 kilometer length of string into, uh, wrapped up in the size of a, a tennis ball. You can imagine how folded that has to be. So the DNA, um, you know, although you might say, well, it's not very big because we only have uh, uh, 20,000 genes. On the other hand, you might say it's colossal because each of us has enough uh, DNA to stretch out to be on Pluto and every uh, the nucleus of every cell is a bit like some kind of incredible uh, miracle with a tennis ball. So where do we uh, then go with this? Well, firstly, I think there's an important point uh, to do with the way in which we've come to talk about and think about DNA as code. So uh, people who work in synthetic biology, um, you know, that is trying to engineer possible new uh, constructs out of DNA, uh, have, uh, there's a particular figure in the field called Craig Venter who began uh, talking about DNA as the operating system for life. So we all know about computers and we know that computers have to have an operating system. So the idea is that DNA is sort of the operating system for life. But of course, that I think I mean, there's something terribly insightful about that, but there's something also slightly misleading because DNA isn't a code that runs on a piece of software. Uh, DNA is also a physical molecule. Uh, so it isn't just a code, it is a thing and a code. Um, and in particular, the DNA uh, molecule has to do something that ordinary programs that we're used to thinking about or apps doesn't do in that it has to build the organism across four dimensions. That it is, it has to make us as our three dimensional entities and it has to do it across time. It has to code for the baby in the womb. It has to code for the, the uh, infant. It has to code for the child and for the adult, um, a uh, frog, we've already seen pictures of frogs, uh, a frog has to code for being a tadpole as well as a frog, and so on. And then finally, the molecule 
is not really separable from the code. So the way we've talked about it folding into this tennis ball, the 40 kilometer string folding into the tennis ball, but the folds themselves are part of making the code readable at different times. So the intricacies of the folding, it's not like you can take the code off and run it independently of the DNA. The DNA is at the same time the thing which runs the code and it is the code. So it's a, so thinking about it like a computer uh, is misleading in particular kind of ways. Now, we've got this idea then that maybe uh, we don't have many genes. On the other hand, there's a lot of information uh, and it's not quite uh, captured by thinking about it like a computer program. So that brings us back to the question then of, well, uh, what do we do for the human sciences uh, with this genetic uh, information and the uh, offerings of the human genome? Now, there is a way of trying to uh, resolve this issue um, that I think maybe we often follow in sort of everyday life and that uh, fits with some of the kind of uh, social science approaches, uh, which is to think, well, yes, yeah, sure, all of those genes that we have, 20,000, know, that still seems quite a lot, that can code for um, the things that we've all sort of already accepted a kind of biological about us. You know, well, um, we know that uh, the shade of hair that we have or our eye color, um, uh, a propensity for men to go bald, these things seem to be uh, uh, controlled in a genetic way. Um, we know even that whether we're tall or not, I mean, this is one of the interesting things because there doesn't seem to be a, in the human genome a gene for being tall. There are lots and lots of genes which regulate how tall you are. And so these are dished out pretty much randomly and it's very difficult uh, to work out from somebody's genome how tall they're going to be. Um, but those things maybe are, you know, physical attributes of us and that doesn't eat into the space for the social sciences. But of course, We've seen uh, th that in other areas of life, and I choose the cuckoo just because I think this makes the e example nicely. The, the cuckoo, obviously, um, I, okay, here we have a picture of a cuckoo chick. I think we all know uh, what uh, nasty tricksters uh, cuckoos are. Um, but cuckoos obviously uh, aren't brought up by their parents. Um, so they're brought up by somebody else's parents who are uh, upon whom they've been foisted. Um, and when the cuckoos uh, hatch from the eggs, they engage in some behaviours which are to do with eliminating their rivals within the nest, which they couldn't possibly have learned. You know, they've never been shown them and there's nobody there in whose interest it is uh, to uh, teach them how to do these things. You have the same uh, issue with some migratory birds. I mean, some migratory birds appear to learn, you know, they join a flock and the rest of them migrate and they join in, but others of them seem to go uh, to, to know to migrate uh, just from the start. So if you look around, you, you can find some examples where in the natural world that idea, well, you know, there are things about our physical composition, which it pipes down to genomics, but the other stuff about our behavior Surely that's all social and cultural and so on. Well, no, that there are examples of things which look like behavior, which don't look they, like they've been learned. There's no necessary arbitrary uh, reason for saying genes can only speak to certain things and not to others about our behavior. Now, there's one final thing I want to say before coming to the conclusion, which is that um, since the uh, enthusiasm for the um, draft of the uh, human genome uh, in the early 2000s, one of the things that has been realized is that there are um, significant limits uh, on the extent to which the DNA codes for our attributes. Um, and often these are referred to uh, under the heading of epigenetics. Now, uh, some biologists, so I'm going to in, explain this in a sec. Some biologists say this isn't exactly epigenetics, but uh, I think it's close enough. One of the things is that um, that's kind of remarkable is that, you know, 
uh, we talk about whether we're 70% like a fish or not. But of course, we're made up of cells that are all the same, except for the, the cells that we're going to use for reproduction. But our cells are otherwise all the same. And yet, of course, some of those cells turn into hairs or fingernails or bits of our brain or our liver or whatever. And so there's an enormous amount of difference between those things which are produced by the same genetic information. So it's not as though you get this DNA and you get this product. Uh, we've all got the same DNA in all our cells, but some of those cells end up being incredibly different from each other. In fact, there's a woman called Eva Jablonka who has this very nice idea that, you know, if we didn't have natural selection through uh, DNA mutations, we could even have, you know, a whole world based on epigenetic variation of the same DNA. Now, uh, so this means that there is a way in which um, the same DNA can produce different outcomes. And of course, if you take that uh, not just within the body, you can take it with, for example, uh, the different life experiences uh, I and my twin, if I had one, uh, would have had, or the different life experiences I would have had had I been born with my DNA makeup in the 18th century or the 6th century or whenever, um, that I wouldn't have become the same person even at the DNA level because the uh, environment influences the way in which the genes are switched on. So the difference between my cells is that the DNA is switched on in different ways and at different times to produce my different cells. And that also happens uh, because of our social and cultural environments. So, going back to the sort of Woody Allen, everything you wanted to know, um, it seems to me that, that you know, there's one uh, possibility which is that the human sciences, we can sort of double down and say, well, yes, that genetic stuff, is, the genomic stuff is very interesting, but we know that cultural and other factors are very important. Or we can say, no, let's have a full-on conversation uh, with people who are interested in uh, the human genome and epigenetics about these things. And I just want to finish by saying that I think we should uh, do the the three things that are on this slide. So firstly, I think there's a lot to be said for working collaboratively with people who are interested in the human genome or genomics more generally. So I've talked a bit about epigenetics. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that people who work on epigenetics from a, a biological point of view, they nonetheless have to come up with a way of understanding the environment because they want to see how the environment affects the expression of um, DNA in the cells. So they are kind of inventing almost like their own social science to talk about the environment. I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of working collaboratively to try to uh, bring what we know from the humanities, the human sciences and the social sciences to discussions about that. Secondly, I think there's an important role for the humanities and social sciences in resisting misleading naturalizations. By naturalizations, I mean the assumption that, well, if the difference is apparent, you know, as in the 18th century, you know, people thought the difference between uh, women and men or people of different races was, or different ethnicities, was obviously natural. Um, it's easy to see a persistent difference between people and then to begin to think about, well, what are the genomic bases for that difference? Now, I think it's important that we uh, speak up for the possibility that those differences uh, are not uh, genomically underpinned in the way that it's easy to assume. There's a sense in which these biological naturalizations tend to be conservative because they take the world as it is and assume that that somehow largely or overwhelmingly arises from biology. I think the critical friend role of resisting that and looking at uh, past mistakes, often inspired by uh, feminist analysis of uh, the history of science, is very important here. And the third thing, of course, is I want to say that the human sciences should join in the feeling of celebration and wonder at the complexity of the genome. Uh, as has famously been said, you know, uh, that it's taken all these billions of years to produce an organism through uh, evolution that is capable of 
examining its own DNA and thinking about what that means. I think that's genuinely an awesome thing. Uh, and that the human sciences should be participating in the investigation and the celebration of that wondrous result. Thank you very much indeed. So Steve, thank you very much for a really interesting and uh, fascinating lecture and yeah, really interesting. So I'm going to move straight into our questions. Um, the first one here is why do the social sciences and genetics need one another? <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I think that's one of these, these things where, um, I mean, they may not think that they need each other, but as far as I can see, the issue is that they're making um, what turn out to be uh, sort of rivalrous claims for understanding the same thing. Uh, so the social sciences want to understand the basis of human conduct. And for several decades, the assumption has been that biology, you know, in some vague way underpins that, but doesn't really have much to do with it. Uh, and of course, with uh, the genomic revolution, uh, geneticists and uh, psychologists of a genetic sort of orientation are convinced that they've got more and more powerful tools for uh, understanding these things. Uh, and so there's a danger that you've got two sets of people who believe they're explaining the same thing, but if they don't talk to each other, uh, you're just going to end up with, you know, sort of parallel universes. So I think they need each other because uh, in order to get the right story or the best story uh, about these things, you're going to need an element of both. And there's a danger that they'll just, you know, neglect the good sense that the other people talk if they only, I mean, it's like one of these Twitter bubble things or whatever, you know, if you only listen to people who've got the same opinion as you, well, then you, you come to live in this world where that's all that matters. So that's why I think they need each other. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I still think there are things which are, as it were, almost completely sociocultural or things which are almost entirely biological, where, you know, it's not that we need each other for everything, but there are a lot of important things for which we do need each other. Yeah, and I think, I think that's interesting. And I'd be interested to hear you say a bit more about that, because I sometimes wonder, you know, with kind of combined relationships between our research councils, I worry that it's going to become increasingly difficult to get di disciplinary specific research funded. So for example, if I want to look at the rise of food banks and how that's linked to, you know, uh, the deteriori deteriorating quality of employment and zero hour contracts and the dismantling of the welfare state, I don't need natural scientists mm -hmm. involved in that. In the same way, they won't need you or I for some of their questions. But I worry that sometimes the funding path is, is maybe going to close that off. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well, no, I, I, yeah, it's actually interesting because um, during that period when I was running the Genomics Forum and we had those other centers for you know, genomics and society, um, there were some people who were saying, you know, what's the ESRC doing giving all this money? to study a biological phenomena, you know, there's lots of money for that anyway, why do we want to be doing this? Which rather missed the point that this was additional funding anyway. Um, but I, I, I absolutely agree with your point that, um, that it would be foolish to think that absolutely everything is interdisciplinary in the same sense, uh, and that there should be no funding which isn't discipline specific. And I think, um, you're right, at least on, on at least two grounds. I mean, one is, as you say, that there may be things which, practically speaking, you know, I mean, a biologist could, or a nutritionist could say something about, you know, the nutritional content of, of foodstuffs which happen to be donated to food banks or become available. Uh, but by and large, um, it's a policy and cultural question. 
Um, and then I think the other thing is that, um, I mean, there's some work done from a kind of a science studies and philosophy of science point of view on interdisciplinary endeavors, where in a sense, what they find is that when people try, I mean, they say, let's take a very interdisciplinary approach to uh, global environmental challenges or something. And because everybody acknowledges from the outset that they want to try to be inclusive and uh, you know, I don't want to step on your toes and I want to create space for you. Um, you. It turns out sometimes that people don't get as committed or as involved in the, you know, they're almost too uh, polite to say, you know, there's, this is really fundamentally a question of atmospheric physics or it's fundamentally a question of geography or whatever it is. Uh, and um, I know that there's been some sort of work on interdisciplinary studies, which shows that sometimes, you know, what is interesting is to have somebody who comes from a strong disciplinary background, who tries to have a look at an interdisciplinary problem. And, you know, it, that may be interesting, both for what they find out and for also because of what it reveals that their discipline can't do about this. So I think that sometimes, you know, there is a, a kind of a pragmatic advantage of saying, oh, well, you know, okay, geographers, you go and do what you can about that. And then we'll, we'll have a look at how far you've got. So I, I think you're right that you, you, one doesn't want to say, well, you know, we can only have interdisciplinary teams. Um, but I think my concern in, in this, this talk was that I do sometimes get this, um, you know, I was looking back over um, uh, Tony Giddens' new rules of sociological method. You know, I know that's from probably uh, four decades ago or something. But, you know, th there were these kind of injunctions that, uh, you know, sociology really should not have much to do with genetics or biology. Um, and I was thinking, well, you know, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea uh, that people um, approach these questions with a, a view in mind that you know, no, ours is the uh, is the primary discipline for these things because uh, it's you know one doesn't unless you make the effort you don't know what has gone on in the other as it were competitor uh, disciplines. Yeah, I think that's right, and it goes back to C. P. Snow and the two cultures, which he wrote sixty years ago, which is also coming at this same question. So now you have a question from Bert, but Bert is actually asking you four or five questions. Oh, wow. So here you go. That I'll read them all out, and we can go back through them if you want. So okay. Bert is asking you, is life inevitable? <laughs> uh, so given the right concoction of molecules, life will arrive. And are there forms of life not based on RNA and DNA? And Sociologically speaking, what do you consider the most important thing genomics has taught humankind so far? Okay. Um, <laughs> what well, I mean, well, the first two, like against? No, no. I, I, I think these are great questions. The first two questions are really interesting. Um, of course, uh, we don't really know the answer. Um, I mean the. It's, it's interesting that in the synthetic biology community, you know, so th these are people who are trying to think about, well, now that we understand how um, biological molecules function, would it not be possible to apply a kind of engineering um, frame of mind to constructing uh, the forms of life that we need, you know, whether that's for, uh, gobbling up carbon out of the uh, atmosphere very quickly or of synthesizing medicines or something of that sort. And there are some people who've looked in that regard at whether, you know, clearly the, there could be some kind of dangers if we start uh, trying to create organisms using the same DNA as uh, we have, I mean, as existing life has, because one might cause, um, I mean, you, you can imagine accidental hybridizations or something. So could one um, try to do something different? 
And so there has been some thought that you could have a silicon based uh, life form in the, the same way. Um, but from what I understand uh, of the um, biochemistry, uh, most people think that carbon has got something particularly special going for it. Um, uh, so that, um, you know, that seems to be way in a, uh, far and away the best place to start. Now, I, I mean, the, um, I'm rather attracted to the idea that life, given the right circumstances, is uh, inevitable. I think the, the puzzle is somehow that, um, I mean, it seems that, that life, it's not like life got going several times on Earth, as far as we can tell, um, with different plans. And then there was a kind of fight to see who had the best plan. Um, you know, everything seems to have basically the same plan. You know, it uses uh, essentially the same sort of chassis for building life. Um, and that suggests that maybe um, there aren't that many options, you know, because biology seems to have tried a, a whole lot of options using DNA. So maybe there aren't that many options in place of DNA. Um, and so if there is life elsewhere, then maybe it will be comfortingly or maybe disturbingly similar to, to what we've got. I mean, I think that that's in entirely, uh, entirely possible. Um, there is, um, there's also a school of thought that, that says that we're a bit too, I mean, um, our scientific culture is a bit too fixated on the DNA aspect of this that the other thing is um, the way in which energy is managed within cells. Uh, so uh, the what's known as the Oxfos relations, the, 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 the re reactions, the way in which energy gets moved around, essentially uh, how a um, electric gradient is built up within cells that provides the energy to drive all of this stuff. Uh, and it may be that that invention, so to speak, uh, was as important as the invention of DNA in getting life started, because DNA without an energy to, to drive it doesn't work either. Uh, and then on the third part of the question, what is the, the, um, the most um, interesting thing from a, a sociological point of view? Well, I, I mean, interestingly, where sociologists have become most uh, involved in these issues uh, has been around uh, the sociology of health and illness. Um, I mean, so there's been uh, a lot on, of, I think, very interesting work on the way in which uh, a genomic understanding of a disease is not only transformational for possible therapeutic understandings and so on of it, but also for the sense of the community who has that disorder or, or, or uh, whatever the condition is. Um, and I think that comes back to your earlier point, Sally, about the way in which these things are simultaneously truths about the natural world and truths about the social world, because you do have this kind of recursive possibility that it's not only a fact about our bodies, but it's a fact about ourselves as agents within those bodies. And I, I mean, that seems to me a candidate. I could come up with others, but um, maybe I should move on to another question. Yeah, no, that, that yeah, that great answer. So <laughs> Thank you. we have another question here that asks whether you think the availability of DNA testing kits and tools like Ancestry.com has led to a greater understanding of genomics amongst the general public. You know, I, I, that's a great question. I'm very interested in that. I, um, I mean, I, Early on, I was skeptical about whether people would be interested in these. But then even when I was at the Genomics Forum, uh, I, people would ring me up out of the blue and say, you know, I'm thinking of getting my boyfriend or my brother-in-law or something, one of these kits for Christmas, what do you think? And I, I began to realize that, you know, there probably is a bit more of a, a demand than I initially suspected about this. Um, of course, the many of the... Um, uh, I mean, 
there's a big sense uh, in which uh, these tests purport to tell you something about your history. Um, but of course, you know, if you say a generation, you know, it's maybe what, 20 or 25 years, you know, if you go back 100 years, well, that's two to the four uh, people that you've come from. If you go back 400 years, it goes up, you know, you, there's a, you've got a thousand great, 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 great whatever, parents um, back there. So that there is the sense in which um, a lot of these things that the tests find, you know, they may be things that are preserved on the, uh, the Y chromosome so that you know that they've come from the father of the father of the father of the father, or they could be mitochondrial, uh, not available in the cheaper test, but you, you know, which come would be inherited through the maternal line. But of course, that only takes you to two of your ancestors out of the thousand that there were only 400 years ago. So that I, I think, you know, in the States, there's been a, in particular, um, there's been a, a concern that there's a kind of a, a, a mis-selling possibility to these because people will find out, you know, that I have ancestry to such and such a place, which in a largely immigrant or for uh, African-Americans forced em em immigration um, uh, society, you know, is possibly meaningful. But then, of course, you've got to understand that it's only a fraction of, of your, your family history. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to, to say about this is that um, uh, I haven't done any work myself on this, um, but a, a book that I was kind of involved in uh, helping to edit and so on um, was about uh, the whole sort of culture that has grown up around these tests. Um, you know, so uh, just like, I mean, this was a uh, surprise to me uh, that you have, you know, children aged YouTube stars who do toy unboxing as a thing, you know, so they get their new toys and they, uh, and they show them off to other kids and, and they get, you know, kickback for that. But you're, you, you have this, um, uh, online uh, culture of people, you know, doing the spit tests and then uh, receiving the the results and, as it were, unpacking their results and sharing uh, their identity as they discover it with with people. And again, that isn't something I ever imagined. You know, I thought everybody, anybody who got this, would want it to be a kind of private thing, and you'd worry about, you know, do you have any of those uh, supposedly uh, telltale things for uh, Alzheimer's or, you know, or you check it by, you know, uh, uh, does your, your wee smell of asparagus when you, when you've eaten asparagus, that kind of, you know, this is one of the results you always get. Um, but, but people seem very keen on sharing this and it's, it's a kind of a social activity in a way that I just wouldn't have anticipated at all. So I think there's a lot there, but certainly in the States, you know, where you've got, uh, um, um, African-American uh, families who are interested in, in where their ancestry might have come from. You know, there has been a lot of concern that people are selling them kits that purport to tell them the answer to that, whereas it's more or less uninformative because a few centuries ago, you have so many relatives that you don't really know where the majority of your forebears came from. Okay, thank you. So the, the final question really comes back to your concluding point. And I mean, when, you know, I think of being a young sociologist, we talked at that time about the relative weight of nature versus nurture, which in some ways you could almost say is a precursor to the mm -hmm. type of talk you're giving tonight. And, uh, you know, I think sociologists were always nervous about, you know, that too much of an emphasis on nurture could very much, uh, or nature could very easily lead back to kind of essentialist notions of, of women or Chinese people, or, you know, which just opens the door for racism or sexism. And I just wonder if you see that as, as an issue that has to be managed in this research. Oh, no, I certainly, do um, but I mean um, two things about this. I mean, I 
One is that I, I do think that there's a very genuine danger of exactly what you're outlining happening. Um, so that, um, I mean, people uh, who um, work on human genomics do, uh, you know, th they want to think about questions like, you know, um, uh, 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 what are the possible evolutionary benefits of uh, um, homosexual desire, for example? You know, so, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, you can see there's a kind of puzzle about, well, how, in what way could that end up being um, uh, evolutionary beneficial? And I know there are some very good, good stories about that. Um, but, uh, you know, but then people say, well, isn't there a danger that if people could uh, identify uh, genomic markers for that, well, then conservative or, you know, culturally hostile people could say, well, you know, could that be edited out or could they have screening for those, those kinds of things? And even as you say, um, in a much looser sense, you might say, well, um, you know, we find that uh, people of uh, East Asian background have such and such characteristics and, you know, well, that's in their nature. Um, now, I, I mean, I, I do see that that's a danger, but I think there's probably no better force to counteract that danger than um, activists from those communities becoming involved uh, and, you know, people not letting it go unchallenged and, you know, calling it out, as we've learned to say, speak about that these days. But I also think that social scientists having, you know, we have the professional platform, you know, we're funded to do research on topics like this. Let's get in there and look at these claims and think about ways in which they may be flimsy or where people have rushed to conclusions too rapidly. And that is generally speaking what has happened, um, that, you know, people uh, assume that, you know, just because something is socially pervasive today, well, you know, it sort of makes sense that that is somehow biological, you know, and um, uh, so let's avoid that, but let's avoid it by finding out enough about the methods and the claims to be able to deconstruct them and to come up with alternative um, accounts of what should be going on there. And finally, I realized you said this was the last question and I, I don't want to um, make a meal of this, but I think the other thing that's very interesting um, that's, that social scientists need to be aware of is the extent to which, you know, you were saying about nature and nurture but of course, you know, this is often spoken of these days in terms of what comes from the genome versus what comes from the environment. Um, but of course, a lot of the people who work on developmental genomics um, want to talk about the extent to which even the environment has a inherited or genomic basis. I mean, so that is whether parents are strict or lenient, whether parents uh, have lots of books in the house, whether they're generous or not. Those may be things which aren't just sociological, but they see those things themselves as biological. So they want that to look at not just the biology of the, the genome, but they want to look at the biology of the environment. And I think that in a way, my guess is the, the contested terrain in the next few years won't so much be the genome, but will be the way in which people try to understand what the environment means. Because if you look at it, um, you know, a lot of recent work in uh, genomically informed psychology, you know, people are making quite extensive claims about how you've got to allow for the, the, the genetic influences on the environment. You know, and they're implying that those are kind of high. So we better be pretty alert to thinking about what exactly the the environment means, because it's not clear that the environment is a sort of a, you know, a safe space for social science. What a fantastically interesting point on which to end, leaving us all wanting more. <laughs> Professor Steve Yearly, thank you for such a fantastic lecture and a really interesting uh, discussion session. So thank you. You'll just have to. Imagine the resounding 
applause. There was okay, but, uh, thank you very much, Sally. It's been a pleasure to do this. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yes, thank you to our audience. Uh, we hope you all have a very nice Christmas and New Year. We'll be back in January with the Holmes Memorial Lectures for 10 to 14 year olds. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Bye bye.